Assalamu alaikum, good evening and welcome to another program of Health is Wealth. It's uh, wonderful to be here and um, get the chance to talk to our viewers and you know, tell them about the, those things because health is wealth. I mean, there's no two ways about it. You realize that when you are in certain trouble, you know, regarding health issues and then that's when you really understand that you're taking your health for granted and you should be looking after yourself uh, much more carefully. Okay, so today's topic is pediatric surgery. And um, that is something that is, you know, very specified uh, part of medicine and uh, we are going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about your concerns when you need to see a pediatric surgeon and what actually, you know, illnesses uh, need to be addressed by such experts. So to talk about today's pro uh, today's issue, uh, we're very lucky to have in the studios with us Professor Nadim Akhtar, who is the Chairman and Head Department of uh, Pediatric Surgery, PIMS. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Sharma, for calling me and giving me an opportunity to come and speak onto your show. It's our pleasure. Okay, so we're going to talk about this and um, before we do, let's have a look at this report. Despite efforts to reduce infant mortality rate in the country, Pakistan still ranks among the 10 countries in the world with the highest infant deaths. This continuous and disturbing trend points to the prevalence of pneumonia in the country and lack of protection against it. Pakistan is the seventh country in the world where every year 90,000 children die at the age of five due to pneumonia. Even though a vaccination for pneumonia is available for the children by the state, people are not aware of its importance and access to hospitals is not available for every child. To reduce the infant mortality rate, breastfeeding should be encouraged, along with vaccines for pneumonia, malaria and diarrhea, as well as improving water and sanitation to help with children's survival. Family planning, better nutrition and treatment of childhood illnesses are all important factors contributing to improving conditions. Another very important measure is to ensure that trained and equipped health workers attend every birth and user fee for maternal and newborn health services are removed. Pharmaceutical companies can do more by increasing the availability of products for the poorest new mothers. Government must rear from its commitment to saving the lives of young children. Okay, hope you found that helpful. Now we're going to turn to our guest. Um, Dr. Arthur, tell us, what is the basic difference between an adult surgeon and a pediatric surgeon? Well, the pediatric surgeon is, is a surgeon who deals with children, you know, not only from the time of birth, but even before that. Mm -hmm. So basically the pediatric age is divided into, into an age which, from the time where the fetus is about to develop, and then it goes on from birth and uh, neonatal age, which is the first one month of life, and then there are the toddlers. And then we have the, the proper pediatric age and then the adolescent age, mm -hmm. and uh, up to the young adult. So in many countries, the pediatric age goes right from the uh, pre-birth age up to uh, 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. So it encompasses a very important age where there are a lot of diseases which, which would, we would talk about as we go along. Uh, and in some countries, the age is from birth up to 12 years of age. So this is basically the definition of pediatric surgery. Right. Now, coming back to your question that how different is it from, from, an, from a, a general surgery, mm. surgical perspective, uh, I always tell my student the child is not a small adult. Mm. It is not a, a, an adult which has shrunk in size. Right. So the children have a different diseases altogether in terms of their etiology, their pathology, their outcome, their management, mm. their understanding. Uh, a child is a special individual mm. in its own right. So they need special care, they need special beds, they need special attention, they need special care of hands who could operate upon them, and a different understanding altogether of the kind of diseases that, that they have and that they carry. Uh, so uh, it is a different entity which came into existence, uh, existence somewhere in the mid middle of the 19th century, 1940 or so, when people begin to realize that uh, the general surgeons, although they're doing a great job, and they still are, not uh, without mm. any... Uh, 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 definition to them, but uh, pediatric uh, surgical diseases have to be handled by individuals who are trained and who have experience in dealing with children because right. their understanding and of the diseases mm. and their outcome is totally different from the ones which are being handled by the, our adult counterparts. Right. Now having said that, uh, how easily available are pediatric surgeons in the country as a whole? Is it some, is it a sort of a, a branch where many people are specializing or we need to see more people being uh, involved in this? Yeah, pediatric surgery is a developed science in the developed countries, you know, it's, it's an entity which without any doubt is, is a complete science or subspeciality of surgery. 
coming to your question, we still are in an infancy, I would say, in, in terms of the number of pediatric surgeons. Mm -hmm. We have a very huge population in the pediatric age because a country of uh, 194 million plus, mm -hmm. according to the census that we have uh, re recently. So we have a very huge number of uh, population where who fall in the pediatric age. Mm -hmm. And our birth rate is very high. And uh, so that makes all the more need to have more pediatric surgeons to, mm. to look and cater for the needs of the children. But unfortunately, uh, our health system has not come to that level mm. or did not, uh, the, the people who regulated this profession, they did not probably understood in time that there will be a need to develop this speciality to the level to cater the need for all the children that we have in our population. So uh, we have very few centers and that too only in the urban areas, mm. uh, only the big hospitals, uh, are offering uh, some form of pediatric surgery. Uh, in, there are centers of excellence, but then there are centers which are coming up. But when we talk about the rural areas, the basic health centers mm. at uh, the SE level or at, uh, at a level uh, where the grassroot level and, and, and periphery, mm. we have a total, uh, we see a total lack of pediatric surgeons in those facilities. Right. Uh, there, these patients and these children are managed still by adult surgeons mm -hmm. and by other people who offer their services. But uh, uh, generally, we have a total, uh, there is a lot of shortage of pediatric surgeons mm. in, in Pakistan. Mm. Okay. So, um, as we, you know, we're identifying that we need more pediatric surgeons and this is a specialized branch of surgery that many people are mm. not actually aware of. We have many cases of, you know, in, in Pakistan, in our country, we see many cases, uh, um, you know, um, instances of cleft palate, club foot. So that's also something that is a disease burden. So then how is that managed? Well, these are uh, very important uh, areas of pediatric surgery because these children are born with congenital defects like hair lip, as you've rightly said, or a club foot. Uh, the ones who reach tertiary centers or reach pediatric surgeons, obviously they are the ones who, manage, who are managed properly and mm. they, the end results are excellent. Uh, we are having uh, a great, uh, you know, awareness about cleft lip and uh, telepies that the club foot. Mm -hmm. uh, we even have uh, international co coordination with us from uh, different uh, international uh, uh, donor agents like uh, a Smile Train is one NGO which is collaborating for the club foot. So we are offering them the state of the art services mm -hmm. uh, almost uh, to as good as any developed country mm -hmm. in terms of the management, in terms of the timing of surgery and the outcome. But uh, the ones who do not reach the appropriate centers or the personal people who are trained in handling these cases, then obviously these are not managed properly mm. and the outcome is not uh, as good as it should be. Mm. How many of these cases do you have to fix? Uh, we, does it we, ever... Yeah, and, and working in a public hospital mm. in, in PIMS, we are overwhelmed and overburdened by these uh, cases because obviously these are not treated uh, or dealt with by other uh, uh, centers. Right. So all of them, they come to us. Mm. And uh, PIMS being a, a tertiary center, and mm. uh, it caters a very large segment, segment of the population. Mm. Almost we have a huge catchment area, including the NWFP, including the FATA areas, mm. and even uh, many uh, uh, patients they come from across the border, even from Afghanistan, they, uh -huh. they come to us. Um, once there, there was a huge uh, population of uh, these Afghan refugees, we used to cater a lot of patients coming from there. Right. So yes, we are over, uh, overburdened by these patients and mm -hmm. uh, we see them in, 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 in num but then the, the number of patients we see, this is not a true reflection of their incidence in the population because since being the only tertiary center offering these services, yeah. so we do get a lot of these cases who, who land up with us and we have to offer them the services. Right, okay. So when we talk about preventive measures, what can be done? Uh, you know, to make the life of a parent e easier, the life of the child easier, and the pediatric surgeon as well, the team as well. What sort of screening can take place for an expecting mother? What what do we have? Yes, we need to uh, understand the root cause of these diseases because we cannot just categorize or generalize them under one umbrella. You know, every disease has its own cause. Uh, like for instance, if we talk about a club foot or we talk about a, a cleft lip. So we must sit with these families, the ones who have children born with these defects, and genetic counseling is something which we must carry out. Mm -hmm. um, antenatal screening is something which is totally lacking. All of these, most of these diseases can be picked up uh, in today's era in uh, before birth. Right. And um, there are imaging modalities, there are genetic tests which are available where mm -hmm. these diseases can be picked up. And I think that is the, the, the place where we need to work more okay. to prevent these diseases 
uh, by that is how the West has done. That is what the, what they did exactly. Mm -hmm. They have eliminated so many diseases, especially the hematological disorders, the blood disorders, mm -hmm. where a lot of children used to die by intermarriages or family mm -hmm. marriages mm -hmm. and other uh, problems which they had in the social aspects. So they have sort of highlighted these issues to a, to a level where now you find less incidence of these diseases. Mm -hmm. And I will also add one or two more diseases which uh, fall in this category where people can be sort of screened before mm -hmm. birth, and that is the, the spinal defect. Effects. And okay. the children who are born with a very big head, we call them the hydrocephalus. So you find these children who, who come to us, they are paralyzed, they cannot move their limbs. Uh, and these diseases can be picked up uh, very easily uh, uh -huh. by trained ultrasonologists uh, who can screen these children at the time of uh, uh, the antenatal screening tests which are done. Mm. So if we work on these areas, probably these diseases can be picked up. And the ones which are not treatable, probably on medical grounds, these pregnancies can be terminated. Or at least we can do some form of genetic counseling to okay. these parents as okay. to prevent them in, in future uh, pregnancies. Right. So um, what, what disorders or, or what problems can be treated while you know, before the baby has been born yet? Yeah. The fetal surgery, as, as the name goes for what you are referring to, is still uh, a far thought in our country. Mm. Uh, I would say that it is not only a uh, far-fetched thought in, in Pakistan, but even in developed countries, you would only have very few centers which would offer fetal surgery. By fetal surgery, we mean that a uh, disease process is identified well before birth, mm -hmm. and some kind of intervention or management is done before birth mm -hmm. and to save the, the, the child. Because fetal surgery has a lot of benefits. Uh, you can save children. It mm -hmm. is a scarless surgery, as it is said, uh, and the outcome can be good. But then it is very, very expensive. So even in developed countries like UK and even in the United States, there are only few centers which mm -hmm. offer this surgery. And that too is still developing. It is still in its infancy. It's still in its embryological state. But people, that is where the people are heading for. That is the future of pediatric surgery. That is, we go to the real uh, grassroot cause and try to, to, to correct it there. But in our country, uh, there are no centers which offer fetal surgery mm. for, for now. But uh, this is something which is for the future to come in this country. Right. But uh, the preventive aspects of the antenatal that I've already emphasized is something mm. that we, we still can work on. Right. Um, you mentioned intermarriages. It's something that is very, very common in our society. Being a pediatric surgeon and seeing these cases coming along, what would you like to tell viewers uh, regarding you know, cousin marriages that have been going on since maybe two or three generations yeah. in a row? Well, I think this is something where awareness, uh, public awareness should be made that there are certain risks, there are certain diseases which are related to intermarriages mm. and the children can be born with very severe congenital deformities. Mm. Uh, cleft lip and cleft palate, these do not come to that severe degree of deformities which, which are of concern, but they can be even more severe deformities like thalassemia, mm. uh, where the children, they, they, they are, parents are running from pillar to post after the birth of the child, repeated blood transfusions, they end mm. up with major surgical intervention and still there is no cure. Yeah. So this is something, uh, genetic counseling is something which we always advocate as, mm. as health professionals. And I think public awareness mm. at, at a grassroots level is absolutely essential. Mm. And uh, we should send this message very clear to the public that the first cousin marriages, they have hazards and they have health hazards. Mm. And uh, as the West has obviously eliminated most of these diseases mm. uh, by um, uh, preventing these marriages, by uh, making public aware of uh, the consequences, so I think that those are the lines where we should uh, work on. And we do that in our wards. I mean, the parents who come to us, mm. we do talk to them, we do give them genetic counseling, but then it needs to be done at a, at a mass level. Right. Okay, now let's talk about um, neonatal uh, surgeries as well. What cases do you have? Is, is it usually the premature births or um, something going wrong in the pregnancy? What what cases do you have and yes, how the, are they treated? Yes, the congenital malformations are a very important subset of pediatric surgery. We have children who are born with uh, two kind of defects, the ones which are picked up by the parents. They would mm. immediately rush to the hospitals, mm. like uh, a child having a uh, a myelomeningocele, meaning that there is a lump at the back, mm. the spine is opened up, or the child has a club foot, or a child has uh, abnormal uh, 
uh, breathing or there is something abnormal coming out from the from the head mm -hmm. so uh, these are the kind of things which the parents would notice immediately and they would come to us but then there's a there's a large set of neonates which have hidden problems for mm -hmm. instance they may be carrying very serious congenital malformations mm -hmm. which were not picked up on antenatal scanning uh -huh. and these parents would only come to know about them or the once they visit a doctor and that mm -hmm. too the doctor would only pick up if he has enough knowledge about those conditions mm -hmm. so we uh, uh, these children or these neonates are brought to us with serious congenital malformations. For instance, they may have intestinal obstruction. Mm. Uh, there's another very s serious uh, problem where the airway is joined to, to the intestine, mm. where whatever the child is breathing is going into the intestine, and the child mm. cannot swallow anything. Mm -hmm. So the spectrum is very big. Okay. Uh, there can be a child who is born without any anal opening. He cannot pass a stool. Mm -hmm. There are children who cannot pass urine uh, right from the time of birth. Mm -hmm. So neonatal surgery, as you rightly said, is a different ball game altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, these are within the pediatric age. These are again a different individuals who need different care, uh, not only from surgical perspective, but to understand the diseases. And then you need people, trained professionals, trained personnel, trained. Uh, nursing staff, uh, you need intensive care units, and just rightly said, the anesthetist who could handle these children mm. and give them safe anesthesia. Mm. So it is not just the surgeon's domain to, to treat them. You need it's the whole team. Yes, it's the whole team work, and uh, the whole team need to be put into place to to offer a comprehensive solution to to the surgical problems of these children. Mm. We hear a lot about uh, you know instances of conjoined twins. Tell us about that as well. Yes, conjoined twin has always raised a lot of uh, interest in, in, in public at large, and also there are a lot of stories with, with the conjoined twins who mm. lived uh, most of their life remaining together. And uh, uh, we do see conjoined twins here, but uh, there, there are two sets, and uh, one of them was successfully separated here in PIMS uh, mm. uh, about 20 years back mm -hmm. uh, by a very eminent pediatric surgeon. Uh, so. These conjoined twins, there, there are two sets. One are those which are separable and the ones which the pathology or the anatomy is such that they cannot be separate. Mm. For instance, they may be sharing a heart, they may be sharing a brain, they may be sharing some such vital organs which cannot be separated and which both the brains. Which would mean yeah. that one would have to, you know, would, wouldn't be able to function without that e Exactly. Organ. Okay. So this all depends what nature has given to them, okay. whether it's a favorable uh, union of the two or right. it is an unfavorable. So I think attempts have been made to, to separate these conjoined twins, hmm. but the outcome obviously uh, depends on what nature has given to them and how easy it is and how difficult it can hmm. be at times. Mm -hmm. Is that something uh, that we see commonly in Pakistan or is it not something that... It's, it's not that common. Probably the reason for that is that most of these are aborted in, in the fetal stage. Uh -huh. So the ones who are born and they are conjoined, there are again two types. One, mm -hmm. there's a parasite where the conjoined twin is already dead. It is just a parasite hanging mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones which are easily separated at times. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't see them very frequently. Either they die immediately after birth, the ones who are born, because they cannot uh, have life which is compatible mm -hmm. to, to, to life. Their, their problems are such that they cannot live. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones who do survive then again depends on what kind of union they have. And uh, recently, uh, we had a one conjoined twin in, in uh, PIMS, and uh, with the collaboration of Saudi government, that patient was flown to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and uh, a set of surgeons were formulated, and they carried out a surgery for almost uh, 24 hours, and successfully the, the twins were separated because we didn't have those facilities here in Pakistan. Right. So uh, there are agencies and uh, there are uh, people there of, who have interest in conjoined twins, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the services are available. But in our setups, we can only separate the one which have favorable uh, anatomy and uh, which are easily separable. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, when w there are very young children involved, or, or maybe not even that young either, a parent is a parent. So how do you counsel the anxious parent who comes to you and is really not happy about surgery and they want you to go to some sort of other treatment? How, how do you handle them? I think we as a surgeons, uh, first of all, must understand uh, the basic human uh, psyche and what the mother is going through especially. Mm. And uh, breaking a news is something which is very important training. It's a mm. part of a training of every surgeon and mm. every doctor. So after once investigated and once we, we want to break the news, we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we don't want to tell them something which has a lot of psychological implication. And at the same time, you cannot hide things from the parents. You have to be honest, you have to tell them uh, in a the truth. But we have to take into account the human or the humane nature 
of that disease. That is always taken into account. So we do sit with them, we try to talk to them, we make diagrams, try to make them understand in the simple words mm. what this is all about. And the first reaction is always very strong, right. which we should expect. Right. And I think uh, uh, once properly explained and once you uh, are able to give them a proper insight mm. into the disease and mm. what you are going to offer. Mm. So I think they do understand at the end, end of the day. But then it is a very, very difficult thing for the parents to hand over a child to a surgeon to take him to the theater and operate. Uh, because it is something which we see the, the scenes are overwhelming outside oh, yeah. the theaters. It's very emotional. It's exceedingly emotional. Mm. And they're totally different from adults because of I course. think the, the attachment that you have to the newborn mm. is, is totally different. Uh, mm. What are the most common fears that you face from uh, parents? What are the most common questions that they ask you and their main concerns? Well, this is very subjective, uh, uh, Shabnam. The, the, the set of parents, this depends on what kind of understanding they have about the disease. So I think the people who are uh, not aware of the diseases, who are not aware of the consequences, and their set of questions are, are very different. simple. Mm. They, they would only ask that how many stitches you're going to apply, Okay. when is the child, how long is the surgery going to take. Mm. But uh, with the internet coming in, uh, uh, with, uh, everyone's with a awareness, Google expert. Yeah, <laughs> so it has made our life easier. But, okay, uh, that's good yeah, thing. Yeah, the, the, the good thing is that the parents understand that uh -huh. there are difficulties, right. which earlier we need to explain to them, uh, drawing diagrams and quoting incidents and studies and all that. So uh, they, they come prepared with a, with a questionnaire in okay. their mind at least right. and they ask very important and pertinent questions that uh, and then it's, it's easy for us to explain to them because they already are knowledgeable about the problem that makes your life easier yeah it's, it, it makes us more i mean it's, it's a little challenging in a way uh -huh. that they, they are aware of it but we take it positively that it's a good thing that the parents are aware of these problems right. and the questions they're going to ask helps us making them understand in a better way about the disease of the child that's great okay so we're uh, going to take a break right now but don't change the channel, stay with us. Hello, welcome back to the program and we are talking about paediatric surgery and we are very lucky to have a paediatric surgeon with us today in the studios. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, now we were talking about, you know, the various um, uh, um, situations and the various illnesses and uh, the children that you have to treat. Uh, now let's talk about the sort of situation where a child comes in because of injury and trauma or an accident. Now, the two sort of questions I have is how would you go about treating them? And the second thing is that parents of young children, what should the house, you know, be be like, it's sort of foolproof proof towards accidents? And then, if there is an accident, what is the basic first aid to give? Yeah, the, these are the two totally different set of questions that you have asked me. Yeah. Let me start with the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, the toddlers at, at home, they mm. are the most vulnerable to, to accidents, you know, mm. because there are all kinds of things within their reach. So the parents have to be, the, remember one thing, Shabnam, that these accidents that take place at home or mm. outside, majority of them are preventable. Mm. So preventable aspects can be taken both at home and outside to prevent these injuries. For instance, small children should not be allowed to go to the rooftop unattended. Uh, there should be certain protective measures should be taken mm. on the rooftop so the children don't fall, fall down. Mm. Because we are overwhelmed by a number of children who reach our accident emergency with head injuries and they fall down from the roof, mm. unattended obviously. Mm. So this adds a lot, not only to the burden of the health care, but to the burden of the whole nation as such. Exactly. Because a lot of money has to be spent. It is not only the mortality that mm. comes with it, but the morbidity with, that the children have to follow with that. Right. And the parents have to uh, spend a lot of money in, in getting cure for these children, and they mm. can end up having uh, vegetative states where mm. they can be in a state where they are not productive to themselves, to the family, or to the society as such. Mm. Now, coming to the toddlers in, inside uh, our homes, uh, 
we should be avoiding things like they should not be uh, able to uh, having access to small particles or objects which they tend to put in their mouth mm -hmm. and they tend to swallow them mm -hmm. and they come with choking of the airways they come choking of the of the uh, eating passages mm -hmm. and which adds to to mortality and these children a lot of these children can die if not given uh, appropriate treatment in time then the road accidents are again very common problem in our our country because of the accidents number of accidents which take place on the roads mm -hmm. and uh, the safety regulations should be in place how to uh, put a child with a seat belt for instance mm -hmm. and special cots and Cribs should be available within the car where legislation should be made and implemented, of course, True. where the children should not like be in the mother's lap. Like we have the seat you know. belt policy where, yeah. you know, the, the driver and <coughs> the, the person yeah. in the front seat has to have a seat belt. Exactly. So this should be made into law too, exactly. Yes, yes. And we see children like in the mother's lap sitting in the front seat. Mm. So all this has to be avoided. These are preventable because if you follow those regular set of uh, instructions, True. yeah. So these uh, these are the, sub the areas which we should work on the preventive fact, aspects. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but what you've said is, ex is really, really very important because we see this so often that you know the parents are sitting in the front the mother has the very small baby or a child toddler whatever in the front whereas they say that god forbid in, in chances of an accident that child actually becomes a shield the child can fly to and hit the windscreen you know yeah. once, uh, the brakes are applied so i think that that is the area where we should look at True. and uh, uh, especially the toys, you know, they, they can be very, very hazardous to children. Mm. And uh, they should be labeled very appropriately that they are suitable for such and such age group. Mm. And that is missing most of the time. And uh, parents go and buy toys because uh, obviously they, the children need toys, you can't deny them. Mm. But they can have small, loose parts which they tend to dis dislodge and they tend to put them in their mouth. Mm. And these are the ones which, which carry very major risks to their lives. Mm. And uh, so th we do get a lot of these patients who come with these, especially these days, I'll just add on to that, uh, through your program, probably a message can be sent across. Mm -hmm. uh, these button batteries, which are very common in toys, which, mm. which produce sounds and lights, mm. children tend to take them out mm. once the toy has gone out of order or whatever, and they mm. tend to put them in their mouth. And these batteries tend to explode within the esophagus, and we get children where the esophagus, the, the windpipes, they're totally blown out, really and they horrific. die. That's really horrific. Yeah, it is. And even if we remove them very early within hours, after ingestion, mm -hmm. they end up with severe complications. So okay. I think this is something, not only the awareness, the legislation should mm. be in place, where these toys, they should be kept out of reach of these children. No, absolutely. So you know that that's a very important message that uh, Dr. Akhtar has actually given. These battery, the button batteries, are very, very dangerous for a young child. If swallowed, they can have disastrous, fatal consequences. So that that is something I think that uh, is very, very important for people absolutely. to understand. Okay, so with, you know, the problem is that, you know, we have the, we have all these elements coming together. We have poverty, then we have the rising population. So what's happening is that you're, you're getting children added to a family after, say, every year or every two years. And then the majority of them are left outside to play outside, but there's traffic or, or as you mentioned, rooftops and things like that. So how do you educate parents who come to you in that sort of a state, what do you say well, to them? Well, in our unit, we have, uh, we arrange certain classes for them mm. so that we sort of, the mothers, they, they, they after the, obviously the disease has been treated. Mm. So we try to address to the preventive aspect of these uh, uh, injuries. Because mm. all these injuries, most of them in my mind is preventable. So mm. we have to, we educate them, we take their classes, we give them pamphlets, we give them handouts mm. so that uh, they, they are aware that mm. it's not only once. I mean, the child, if it falls once, he can fall again because he's mm. going to be going back to the same environment exactly. again. Exactly. So this is the message that we tend to give them in, in our units and wards. So that is what we are doing at our end. Right. Uh, one thing more that I would add here is the stray bullet injuries. That is something which uh, probably Very probably is not on the list in, of your yeah. In weddings so and things, exactly. uh, we should always remember that whatever goes up has to come down. So right. firing on uh, anniversaries, mm. on weddings, on mm -hmm. festivities, it's mm. a common thing in, in, in our country. Mm. And uh, people uh, do a lot of firing in the air and True. out of uh, pleasure as well. So children, we, we get children, for instance, a child, recently I had a child who was sleeping uh, with a mother and suddenly mother found that uh, the child started to bleed and once the x-rays were done, it was found that he has got a bullet lodged in the head, in the, oh. in the brain. So uh, it is uh, obviously they, they are baffled to know that where does this bullet came from, mm. who fired, mm. and they have no answers to these questions. And we get these bullet injuries in the abdomen. These are stray bullets which are firing missiles like projects are 
these are just firing, firing all around. So this is something which, which needs to be brought to an end. Mm. And uh, we must highlight this uh, to, to, to the public and mm. to the legislators again, mm. that the proper laws should be made to prevent these uh, indiscriminate firings. That's absolutely true. I mean, that, that is one of the, the most tragic sort of events, you know, where, where somebody's celebrating something yeah. and doing it in such an irresponsible mm. way that it actually takes the life of especially a, ch a small child. Yeah, the, the, the brunt of all these injuries are borne by children because they are the ones who are playing outside in the fields, uh, outside yeah. of home or the rooftops. And these bullets can come and hit anybody, you know, and it, this can happen to an adult. So, right. and nobody is, is, is immune to that. This can mm. happen to, to anybody's Anyone, child. exactly. Yeah, it's just, exactly, it's yeah. just your luck. So, you know, we need sort of more aggressive media campaigns as well, don't we, to raise for, for, awareness? For all these things, yes, absolutely mm. right. And I'm, I'm glad that these such programs are held and the public is made aware of. Mm. And uh, these should be made a part of a routine uh, sort of a media campaign in the form of uh, pamphlets, in the form mm. of uh, like print media, radio media, programs, yes. television, exactly. exactly. Okay, so um, let's talk about a situation where a, a parent, a mother, or, or a father finds that their small child is choking. What should they do? Yeah, it's very important. You know, children can choke any time, and this choking—it's uh, not always because of inhalation of some object putting uh, in, uh, in the mouth, but the child can vomit. He can he can throw up a milk, mm. which can be a normal phenomenon at times, and they mm. can choke with their own secretions lying in the bed. Uh -huh. So I think uh, the basic life support we must uh, the parents should know what the basic life support is mm. all about, and mm. a child whose airway is choked who cannot breathe. Mm. Uh, the airway has to be opened up immediately and the, ch the parents must know how to act and what to do at that time. Yes. So uh, uh, first of all, after the feed, the mother should be very careful how the proper burping should be done. The, the baby should be, you know, certain patting should be done at the back mm. so that all the air that he has swallowed needs to come out. Mm. And then the feed should not be, uh, to, to, should be to a limit, you know, don't overfeed a child, a newborn okay. or a small baby I'm talking about. Right. And then the baby should be kept at about a 45 degree angle. And uh -huh. sometimes if you have to make the baby lie, it should be in a prone position rather than a supine position where they tend to vomit Side and, and aspirate. Uh, the baby should be in the sideways in, in, in position? In the sideways or the prone, you know, it should be upside down or the uh -huh. sideways. But okay. do not keep them straight in the bed. Mm. And if you have to make them lie, it should be a 45 degree angle where the right. child Right. Okay. Can. Now, uh, as you just said that, we have this huge uh, 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 society thing that, you know, when a baby is born, so that the shape of their head remains in a certain way, everyone will be putting that baby straight, you know, and not on the side or whatever. Mm. What about not, that? Not only that, they wouldn't just make them lie straight. They would put certain pillows around the head or, to make it a shape. Or put their head in something. Yes. So they, by doing so, they would take away those natural instincts of a child to move the head from mm -hmm. one side to the other in case he vomits. Mm -hmm. So I think that is absolutely uh, absurd, mm -hmm. and uh, this should be discouraged at, at all level. Mm -hmm. And uh, the children should be ha should be handled in a way which is uh, does not bring harm to them. So right. after feeding, especially, they should not be made to lie straight in mm -hmm. the, the bed. And uh, there is a condition called sudden infant death syndrome where a normal, healthy child without any disease, mm. after the feed, the mother put the baby to bed or mm. in a cot mm. and suddenly finds in the morning the child is dead without mm. any reason. Mm. So one of the major reasons is, of course, the vomiting Ch and aspiration, choking, choking mm. which, which comes with it, yes. What else do we know about SIDS? SIDS is a, is a phenomena which we see mostly in the Western countries. It's less so common here. Mm. Uh, reasons we don't know. We cannot cite the reason. But one reason is that the mothers are, are not attentive. They're, they're, they have they're overworked. They're working outside the, the house. They leave mm. the family. So here we have more children probably. The mothers are more involved in the, in the, in the care. And the children are usually we have this sort of a culture where the children are sleeping yeah. next to the mother yeah. rather than in a cot or a crib. Not only that, they can be a younger elder sister who would be looking after looking the after, child. Right. Right. And uh, so there are more people in the family uh -huh. probably to look after. Mm. So we, we have less instances. But then this is something which is preventable, purely preventable. Mm. And this brings a, a, a sudden death in a family without any reason mm. is, is, is obviously a traumatic. great and traumatic. Yes. yes. Okay. So an older child, a toddler choking on a foreign object, what should a parent do? Yes. Uh, the, the mother should, first of all, should immediately turn the child in a, in a position, in a prone position, in a, in a upside down, okay. and pat the back, try to bring that object out. Okay. And the airway has to be cleared at all costs. Mm -hmm. And try to open the tongue and try to pull it out if, it, if possible, but in a prone position. Mm. 
Now, in doing so, the, they have to be very careful not to push it further into the airway, mm -hmm. which can further mm -hmm. be more hazardous. Mm -hmm. and, and if they are not able to do so, they have to call the health professional, they have to call for help, they have to get or to the get to the nearest uh, emergency uh, hospital, or uh, call in an ambulance, or mm -hmm. call in other people to help them out. Right, okay. So, um, children who faint all of a sudden, uh, young ones or, or a bit older as well, what is do, how many people know about the recovery position and what they should be doing with the child at that instance? I think what you are referring to is uh, the concept of a basic life support. Suppose a child or an adult for that matter walking mm. and suddenly faints and falls down mm. and he stops breathing. Now that is something where the basic life support these days we call it the ABC of, of the body that the airway, the breathing and the circulation mm. at any time they have to be maintained. Mm. So the, the, the first of all if you find somebody who falls down, uh, becomes unconscious, mm. the first thing is call for Help. Okay. Whoever is around you, uh, passerby, uh, a pedestrian, you just call them. Okay. Then shout the name of the person if you know him mm. and try to wake him up, give him a little push and you see what is the response. Mm. If the person responds then obviously he, he is, is not in any serious uh, condition, he can be taken to the hospital or mm. the professional can be called in. But if there is no response, you must immediately start the cardiopulmonary resuscitation, what we call it the CPR, mm. where the chest has to be pushed in, the cardiac, uh, you know. Uh, uh, now these things, I think, uh, basically can be taught to the public. Uh -huh. Now it has become mandatory in every hospital, mm. uh, where even uh, a, a guard up to, up to the, the senior most people, they have to go through these courses of basic life support. Uh -huh. And this has happened in hospitals, in tertiary hospitals where people faint and you would find that people would just gather around it, they start looking at, at that patient without mm -hmm. knowing what exactly to exactly do. Exactly to do, yes. And there have been recordings on, on, on television where the, the cameras have picked up these instances in a tertiary hospital mm -hmm. where a doctor fainted and nobody did anything and, and then that person died. Mm -hmm. So these are, some of them are preventable mm -hmm. and if it happens in the roadside people should know mm -hmm. how to do the CPR at least, and how mm -hmm. to call for help and what mm -hmm. posture should be adopted. And these, some of the deaths can be prevented. Right. And of course, CPR on a child would be completely different. It is a different CPR, and we, we don't recommend anybody doing it unless they know about it, because mm. you can cause iatrogenic injuries and, mm. uh, and mm. can cause more harm. Mm. But these are very easily performed. There are dummies available right. where these can be taught to, to, the, to the parents. Mm. And, uh, uh, and these films are available on the, on the net uh, where, where mothers can go and see them. Right. How, how these are done. The, the basic thing is that they are, they are unaware yeah. that these things cannot happen. But then these are all things which, which happen every day in, in families and in exactly, any kind of a setup. Exactly. Uh, I remember an, instant, uh, an instance when a neighbor's child, uh, one and a half years old, uh, went into the bathroom and there was a bucket mm -hmm. with water in it. It wasn't really that much water, but the child fell in upside down and drowned. Yes, drowning is, is obviously the, one of the very dreadful, mm. uh, and you see here people are taking, uh, in, in, wind, in summers especially, you'll find children heading towards uh, uh, certain canals or certain mm. unattended mm. places where there's a puddle of water. Mm. So the drowning can take place, and uh, mm. obviously for, in first instance these, they, they, should, they should not be allowed to do that, mm. uh, and they should be accompanied by the parents if they have to go to the, to the swimming pool or to, to, to these areas. And uh, obviously there, there should be facilities available there mm. and the guards should be available mm. there, the lifeguards should be there to, to, to resuscitate at least the ones who, who get drowned. Mm. So again, these are all preventable uh, injuries. Right. What illnesses, childhood illnesses, if left untreated, then present themselves as um, surgical uh, issues? Yes, uh, every disease has to be dealt with on merit. Every disease has to be dealt with according to a certain time frame. Uh, for instance, I have a friend and uh, uh, he has a club foot which has not been managed properly in his early life. Mm -hmm. And he still walks with a limp. Uh -huh. And uh, obviously one has to wear certain special shoes. Mm -hmm. the, the adults, they try to adapt themselves mm -hmm. so that it is not apparent to other, to other people in the society. And as, as children who are not dealt with these, for instance, a hair lip, dealt improperly or not dealt at all in an in a, in a age where it should have been treated, mm. it has a lot of psychological implication on a child, mm. especially once she's going to school. Mm. And because other children are going to point out these illnesses or these defects which, mm. which he's carrying, mm. and they uh, end up having severe psychological problems, mm. which are even more difficult to treat than the physical ailments that of they carry. Yes. So um, what, uh, what would you tell parents to do, you know, to be uh, sort of on the lookout for. Sometimes 
because children, when they're very young, uh, you can't, they have a problem communicating and they're not being able to tell uh, parents, you know, what's like, like, let's just take a, a common example, a stomach ache. When does a parent know that they have to take their child actually to a pediatric surgeon instead of a pediatrician? Well, uh, I would not say that th in the first place there are not enough pediatric surgeons to, right. to, for the parents to go and, and, and visit them. Mm. They, the first thing is the first line of treatment, of course, is a basic medical treatment. They must attend to a doctor. Right. Wherever they live, whether it's a rural society, it's mm -hmm. an urban society, wherever they live, so they must go to the health professional who is trained, who knows what it is. Mm -hmm. Then comes the training of that particular doctor. He has to pick up that which child needs the, uh, to be referred to a surgeon, mm -hmm. which child has an underlying surgical problem. And that is where we uh, uh, try to offer these uh, uh, communication to, to even to the healthcare professionals that they must be aware of these conditions. Mm. They should not continue treating them on their own mm. and where they feel that a surgeon needs to be uh, taken into the picture, they, these children should be referred to him mm. uh, in tertiary centers where they are treated. Now, you do not have pediatric surgery at a primary care level all over the world. Right. It is a specialized field available in tertiary hospitals. Mm. So for instance, when I was uh, being trained in the UK, we mm. used to get calls from the general practitioners. Mm. They used to ring us even in the middle of the night that they have a child mm. who is crying and who is drawing the legs and they think that he has got intestinal obstruction. Mm. Uh, a small baby of about eight or nine months of age. and. We immediately used to tell them, okay, refer the baby to us and we will take care. Mm. And once you do an ultrasound or an x-ray, you find that the child does carry an underlying surgical problem at times. Okay. So it is not only the, the, the mothers who should be aware of that. I think mm. it is the health professionals, the basic health care givers. Mm. They should be aware that the children who need surgical uh, uh, consultation, mm. where they think that there may be an underlying surgical problem, mm. they should immediately know where to refer this child and they should not treat him any further. Right. And, um, you know, just briefly, because we're, we're running out of time for the program, uh, many myths that we hear about newborn babies as well. One thing you hear a lot is that, that when a, a baby in their first year, their first summer and their first winter is very important because the illnesses they'll get because of that season would stay with them for the rest of their lives. How true is that? That, that I think is true in, in a sense that if they are carrying some allergies, if they're carrying if they're known asthmatics, the, mm -hmm. the, the parents are asthmatic, so children can have asthma. So many diseases, um, the medical diseases, is they do come up and they pronounce themselves in the first one year of life. So from that perspective, it is, it is, it is correct to a certain extent. But then you cannot put every disease to, 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 to that uh, the category. The first summer yeah. or first winter. <laughs> so we ho hope every child passes the first summer well and the first winter well. But then, the, especially the ones who are asthmatic in, in winter time, once uh -huh. uh, the, the winter sets in, uh, or in the summer or the spring seasons, once the, mm -hmm. the pollen and the allergies uh, are, are more, they tend to develop certain problems and they can have underlying surgical problems as well. So we uh -huh. have, uh, the diseases have uh, seasonal variations. Uh -huh. uh, like for instance, there's a disease called intersusception, which means that one part of the gut telescopes into the other part. Now we have the, in, in, in uh, autumn and in, in spring seasons, the incidence and the number of patients who come to, to emergency, they certainly prop up. Uh -huh. And the reason is that they, they're more allergy that need the, the intestinal motility that alters and that tends to telescope. So it is not only true for medical problems, but mm -hmm. for surgical problems also, they can have seasonal variations. Right, okay. Uh, Professor Nadeem Akhtar, thank you so much for joining us here today and uh, passing on such valuable information for all of our viewers here today. Thank you very much for calling me here. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, so we come to the end of a very, very informative program. Lots and lots for you to uh, learn from. Lots and there's so much there that can guide you. And when it comes to children, uh, we value them more than we value ourselves, our own lives. So, you know, they're, they're all that more special and they need all that more attention and all that much care. So um, we hope you've enjoyed the program. Do stay in touch with us on our Facebook page, Health is Wealth. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your feedback and yeah, the, all the issues that you want us to talk about. So until next time, stay happy, stay healthy. Bye-bye.